really the best. It's like, oh, there's a question. Like I said, I do best questions. with an, with audience questions, and we just like get into a dialogue. It's like Socratic method. Speaking of which, the Socratic method of learning, of teaching, is to ask questions and to for the the teacher really to to guide the student to come up with the questions to, to, and to learn how to ask questions and how to answer their own questions, how, learning how to learn. There was actually a study in Connecticut in a school district years ago uh, that where the, the administration of the school dis district said, we're going to change how we learn. We're going to try the Socratic method here for a while. And they, so they implemented that and the student scores all went up and the amount of, the, I know about it as an eye doctor because the rate of myopia went down. They stopped becoming so nearsighted and yet they were learning more. Uh, and then when, the, when a new administrator was brought in, they went back to the old method. So it was a bit of a controlled study. It was, you know, a, a baseline reversal type of study. And, and yeah, it, it showed that we don't have to have so much disease and discomfort even from our learning and learning process in school, if we are more centered on the process rather than the product, to say, you need to learn this, this, and this, so memorize it, and then spit it back accurately the way I told you to. Well, where's the locus of control? Where's the center of control? It's in the teacher. That's not how we learn. Studies on, on cats and learning how to see found that at Harvard, Nobel Prize winning research, Hubel and Wiesel, uh, they hooked up two cats to a, a, a rotating device, so both were in a harness. One cat was in control of the movement, the other was moved passively. And so they both, and they both were presented with the exact same visual stimulus. So same visual environment, same movement through the environment, so the same exact stimulation on the retina. And what they found was the cat that moved had normal vision. The cat that was passively moved had the same stimulation on the retina, was functionally blind, could not see, could not get meaning out of what they, what was coming into their eyes, out of the light coming in the eyes, couldn't control movement out of that, they were functionally blind. And with cats there was a, what they called a critical period, was developed, out, the concept came out of that study, where if they didn't develop it by a certain age for cats, then they could not develop it later with any amount of experience. We've found since that, that humans don't have that kind of critical period. We have relative periods of criticality where, you know, yes, there's more neuroplasticity at a younger age, our brain is growing and therefore it can develop easier. But even elderly people after a stroke, people after car accidents, there's neuro, neuro, neuro optometric rehabilitation uh, going on that, uh, that, that proves that we can retrain, we can relearn as human beings, we have much more what's called neuroplasticity, ability to change and learn and grow and re reconnect our nerves to each other at any age. So there's hope there. Um, so let's, what was the question we were Oh, I had asked about, about. Uh, the uh, DVDs. Oh, yeah. And you're yeah, I was saying, so here's, here's just a, a little insight to, you know, how the model developed. And there's, there's many stories along the way, but uh, this, when we were doing our DVD series on, on, the, on the clinical theory of everything, you know, for each segment, each session, I stepped back and said, you know, let me look at the overview. That's my approach. We want to cover the whole territory. Because so, if, we, if we're missing a big chunk out here, like, you know, conventional science has many questions that aren't addressed, that aren't answered. The question of uh, the, the, there's the, the big questions we go into, like the arrow of time that, that's never been answered in thousands of years of philosophy and science. And we say, that's an important question. Why? Because very few people are talking about it. But yet there's evidence on a quantum level that at a quantum level, there is no forward and reverse time. Uh, time can go either direction. No, it's reversible. And yet at a macroscopic human level, we know that we can't reverse time. We're moving in one direction. How is that? What is that? What's the distinction? How does that work together? So, uh, and there's evidence, clear evidence, in terms of consciousness of reverse time communication. In animals, the, the study on, on dogs, knowing when their owner's coming home and they've controlled it so that they're not coming from the same place or not coming from the same distance not coming the same pathway, but about five minutes before the owner comes home, the dog starts checking the door. 
How do they know that? It's, there's a reverse time communication. The dog is getting a message from their future self that it's going to be happening. We have this in humans with, with controlled slide presentations where certain slides being shown com computer controlled randomly by random number generator, certain of the slides have, have emotional impact and you can read the body's physiology of that response. And, and conventional theory would say, well, the response has to be after the stimulus. But no, the response in those emotional, strong emotional slides happens before the stimulus. Not only that, it, when, they, when they, uh, control, they control us with a random number generator and the random number generator hasn't even determined the random number yet to determine which slide is going to be projected. So the computer doesn't know, the scientist doesn't know, it can't know on a conventional level of, of, of modeling what slide's going to be presented. Yet the body knows what slide's going to be presented before the computer does, decides which one to show. And it's interesting because that response doesn't come from the brain, it comes from the heart, which is in oriental medicine, the integrator, the, the, the coordinator of all the other systems, all the emotions, it's, it's you know, it's the real emperor. <laughs> so, uh, so I was going to mention how uh, with this model in the last couple of years, so many times, dozens and dozens of times, I'll ask a question, a big question, like if this is true, if this model is, is correct, what else does that imply? And this is real science. Science is when we have a prediction that we can then validate or we can falsify. We can say, no, actually it didn't come out that way. Good. Now we get to tune up the model and make it better. It's been hard for me to make the model better <laughs> over the last couple of years. We're growing it. We're filling in the details, but not having to change the fundamental structure of the model. And this is a model that, that, that coordinates with subatomic physics and cosmology. And it, and it has very different answers than the conventional sciences in those areas, as well as biology, medicine, learning, consciousness. So uh, an example is uh, in my research on frequencies, I was having a difficult time uh, getting certain frequencies, uh, like the right frequencies, certain hertz frequencies in the auditory range, but electromagnetic frequencies, to be stabilized in a liquid medium as, to be able to use them as, as a medicine, as a liquid medicine of that frequency signature. So some were working, some weren't working. So I had this challenge. And I thought, hmm, we know from modern alchemy that the alchemists working with Ormus, with uh, the, the, the highest product of alchemy is called the Philosopher's Stone. It's a, a material substance that's also a spiritual substance. They consider it the, the carrier of, of divine intelligence, of intelligence, of uh, the, the material of, that makes up the conscious body, the spirit body. And, and there's evidence of it being super fluid, super conducting, uh, as well as the, uh, having all the characteristics of, of the quantum world, which is a wacky world, so-called, but so is the spirit world, where you know, a spirit can go through material substance. Your body spirit can, is in, inside your body, but it can leave the body. You can have an out-of-body experience. You can have a near-death experience. You can see veridically, truly, from some other point in space, like up in the corner of the room, your spirit can see the real world as it is, a true visual experience, while your brain is flatlined. So, so our model accounts for that. It has to. These are real obser observations, and that's what science is. Science is observation. And then it's modeling to understand those, to have a, a model is always a model. It's never true, it can't be proven, but it can be useful. It can be an accurate, give us accurate predictions, accurate description, accurate understanding, and therefore be able to navigate the real world. And when we bump into something we don't expect in the model, we need to change the model to account for that world. It's like Piaget's uh, French medical doctor who observed child development and found that when children develop, as they develop, they develop different levels of modeling of their understanding of their world. You know, a, a young infant doesn't have the concept of, of the permanence of objects. If, if, if we move this, this thing that they, they see and, and, and we hide it, it's gone. 
they don't have a concept of permanence, of, of that stability of, of physical existence. And then they have enough experience of it, you know, and, and what, it's f getting the observation is fun. It's like, wow, I didn't expect that. That's cool. That's cool. And when it's, as soon as they get object permanence, it's not as cool anymore. The peekaboo game, you know, is not as fun for the older child. They played it. They know it's already there. You didn't fool them. It didn't disappear. It just went behind something. Right? So we develop our concepts according to levels of modeling, of understanding, and then if, if we're able to take in the observations of what doesn't fit our model, we collect enough of those, we can see there's a pattern, and we can let go of our current model and expand our model and say, oh, now I see how that is part of it too, and how what I thought before wasn't the whole story. Right? I'm trying to see the whole story. So it, when we're working with those frequencies, I thought to myself, hmm, the, the alchemists are saying if they try to make Ormus, if they try to refine and, and, and create this, this spiritual uh, material substance, they can't, it's impossible to do on an electric stove because the electromagnetic frequencies in that field drive it away. It goes through what's called Josephson tunneling in physics. Tun it tunnels right through the, the, the material pot or pan or the vessel that you have it in. It, it'll go from the inside to the outside. It'll climb over the, the edge. It'll, it'll, it'll go away. It'll bilocate to somewhere else. And <clears throat> so we know then that there's a frequency that's disharmonic to spirit. It's 50 hertz and 60 hertz frequencies that are ubiquitous in our modern environment. In fact, we can measure them in the ionosphere. In the ionosphere, the upper atmosphere that's electrically conductive, it's like a capacitor with the ground, groundwater, and we live in the middle here. It's the, the electrical space we live in. We can measure the 60 hertz frequency in the ionosphere over the United States. And we can measure the 50 hertz frequency in the ionosphere over Europe. There's studies also on spontaneous tone generation where it shows that populations that live in a 60 hertz power cycle area like the United States, if you ask, ask 100 people to spontaneously make a tone, a sound, that the peak is at 60 hertz for people in an area where that's the frequency that's used. It's at, the peak is at 50 hertz in, in areas that use the 50 hertz cycle. So we're, it's what we're being tuned to. And it wasn't selected because it's good for us. <laughs> it was selected because it was a, just a number that worked. It was a convenient number in the early development of, of that, that technology. So, so I thought, if there's a disharmonic frequency, perhaps there's a harmonic frequency. Maybe I can find it. Maybe that will help me to uh, attract these spirit minerals that are superconducting, and maybe it's the superconductivity that's present everywhere to a degree, but if we can concentrate, maybe we need more of that to be able to hold some of these frequencies in solution. Because, why? because just like a homeopathic remedy, you put that information into the structure of the water, and, or, or alcohol and water, or lactose as a, as a, a carrier, and it stays there, you know, as far as we know, for at least over 100 years. Uh, probably indefinitely, which, which points toward the possibility that it's a superconductive effect within that material. And there is evidence, uh, Navy research, evidence of superconductivity in, in biological systems. Uh, we'll go into more detail, you can watch the videos on that. So I sat there with a right frequency generator and, and went tenth of a hertz at a time and, and then Went, started going at one hertz at a time over about 20 hertz. And for, so for a couple of hours, I was just testing frequency by frequency. It became a meditative activity. I love that, you know, something I can just pick away at and I'm not even thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, the effect shows up that I'm looking for. Wasn't thinking about it, just brought me present, looked at the, the dial, it was at 172 hertz. Okay, I didn't know anything about 172 hertz. Took a break, came back to see if I could replicate it because we're dealing again with subtle energies. The, the, the state of mind, the intention of the observer is critical. It's absolutely critical. That's why, you know, 30 years of practice at this, it's easy for me. It's, it's, uh, but I'd like to teach other people so when I leave, 
that somebody else can do this. And why I've looked at other automated systems that are now able to tap into non-local biocommunication to, again, to support and replicate and extend what, what I found with my own system. Uh, so 172 hertz, and I came back and it was confirmed, and I tested it a couple times. I, I came with, at it the third time holding a skeptical perspective, because that's important. Is it, is it robust? Do, if, I, if I'm thinking, yeah, but probably not. It's probably not really it. I probably just am thinking it, and I'm making it happen. Even from a skeptical perspective, it was telling me, no, this really is something. Okay, good. And, and so I went online to see, well, if I've observed this, maybe somebody else has observed something. I'm looking for scientific studies with 172 hertz. You know, Reif did a lot of work with with frequencies. He didn't observe anything special at 172 hertz, but he was looking for frequencies that were disharmonic to organisms like viruses in the body. So he's looking at a different thing. He's looking at a microscope that he created that is beyond even the capabilities we have today of seeing, because he used frequencies of light to visualize viruses in the living state. He could see when he would create an electromagnetic frequency that would, like Ella Fitzgerald breaking the glass, would break the glass of that viral particle, which is a, a DNA crystal, maybe with a, a protein coating. So, uh, really didn't find much until I came across a reference that said 172 hertz was considered the dominant harmonic frequency of nature. And this was thousands of years ago in China and Tibet. And so for a thousand years, that they considered a thousand years of peace, it was the most revered, the most revered thing in the, China, in the empire of China at that time was the, their metric standard of, I don't know if it was uh, probably a bowl or a bell, I would guess a bowl, uh, of, that would resonate at 172 hertz, and every year they would make multiple copies to tune it to, to that original and send one out to each province for every year, making sure that the music, that, that, that everything that they could tune w was tuned to that frequency. So that was more precious than the emperor. It, it stayed in the emperor's palace, you know, in the, in the, the uh, forbidden city, but the emperor was replaced generationally. This one bowl was never replaced for a thousand years. It's like, gave me goosebumps. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's better than a scientific study. It's, it's, this is like an epidemiological study of a thousand years over a, a huge portion of, of the planet, Tibet and China, that observed this, used it with success, with peace. So it's a harmonic frequency for the spirit, for the spirit minerals. And so uh, we, we have lots uh, lots to do to to expand that research uh, my vision is that that we can uh, one day be cooking our food on a harmonic frequency of 172 hertz rather than running or we should run the electricity of the planet if we're going to have wired circuits uh, running electrons that should be at 172 hertz uh, to be able to to bring attract more spirit, more consciousness, more nourishment for the, for the soul, uh, to, these, to our kitchens, to our spaces, our offices, to, and to bring that more greater uh, Ormus spiritual nourishment into the food that we're cooking. Uh, so from that 172 hertz, when I was doing the videos, I thought, if that's true, and, 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 I, and I looked for harmonics with the same method of testing, I could not find other harmonics of it, you know, double it or, or have it, but theoretically there should be something there. So I thought, let me see, just in the, in the literature and the research, what I can find that, that, that might support, are there harmonics, are there significant harmonics to that 172 hertz that, that makes sense in, in the physiology of the body? Because we know there's certain frequencies, you know, the alpha rhythm, somewhere around 10 hertz. We know the heart rhythm, about 1 hertz. We know the, that there's a harmonic uh, breath cycle at about 0.1 hertz. So there seems to be a, a factor of 10 there, a decade type of resonance between the breath to the heart, 0.1, 1, 10 hertz. Not only the brain, but also skeletal muscles at 10 hertz. And one of the theories on why the brain 
rhythm, the, the central balance of alpha rhythm is at about 10 hertz, is related to the eyes and the eye muscles. The eye muscles are striated muscles like the skeletal muscles, although they're more, much more finely tuned. There's one-to-one -one correspondence between nerve and, and muscle cells, which is very different than, than gross motor, motor movement, even finger muscles, fine motor. So it's a very fine control. We know it's related to rapid eye movements is when we're sleeping, when we have dreams. Uh, so there's, there is a correspondence between eye movement, eye muscle activity, and, and brain rhythm frequencies. There's the notion that the, uh, the, the ventricles in the brain are like an antenna that, that, that transmit that signal to the various parts of the brain. Uh, so, so I thought, what's, what's happening at, uh, at these other octave frequencies related to 172 hertz? And does that possibly tie in with these decade uh, you know, factor of 10 frequencies that we know about in, in the physiology of the body, the, the lungs, which is the metal element, which is actually the, the starting point of consciousness and spiritual development in oriental medicine. We breathe in spirit. Spirit means breath. Right? That's, that's where the word comes from. <laughs> Inspiration <laughs> is breathing in. Um, so we start with the breath, the metal element. The next element in the development of consciousness in oriental medicine is the fire element, which is the heart is the, again, the core, core means heart, <laughs> is the core of that. And the heart rhythm is about one hertz. So we have that relationship, that, that trans, uh, like uh, transformation, it's like a transformer changing the frequency from, from the breath cycle of, of 0.1 hertz or a 10 second breath cycle. The fact is, if you breathe in and out on a cycle that is close to 10, hertz, 10, to 10 seconds per full cycle, your body will take over and automatically lock in to exactly 10 seconds as a cycle. It's, it's, it's an observed phenomenon. It's one of these finely tuned biological uh, responses of the system. So that's a balanced frequency, and it's a desirable frequency. When we're stressed, we're, we, we stop breathing, or we breathe faster, but when, when we're relaxed, we'll automatically go into that 0.1 hertz breathing rhythm. Our heart will go to about a 1 hertz, and the brain will go to about a 10 hertz. So the, the heart was the second. The third element is the earth element. Well, that's the element that's associated with, with thinking. So it's not just the brain. In, in, Western, in Western thinking, Western modeling, we're all about the brain. Oriental medicine, they didn't think much about the brain. It's co controlled by the water element, which is like the kidneys that governs it. But, uh, but the thinking is associated with the earth element. And so you know, that, that makes sense in terms of the one, two, three, the development of the, the cycles from uh, speeding up from the breath to the heart to the thinking, which is associated with earth element, which is your stomach, spleen, pancreas. They're all over in this area. So we're, we're moving in a curve physically in the body. The lungs, of course, are on both sides, but the right lung doesn't have to share space with the heart like the left lung does, so it's the larger lung. So the, the center for the lungs, if we take the entire space of the lungs, it's going to be to the right of the midline, to the right of center. And the heart, we know, is on the left side of the center. So there's the cycle so far. Okay, so uh, we, we know that there's the, the beta rhythm of activated, you know, if you're thinking, if you're like reading something and you're processing what you're reading, you're thinking about it actively, you'll be in beta. If you're stressed, you'll go into beta. So it's an activation of brain function to a higher frequency range. In the teens, into the 20s, you're in beta, somewhere in there. So not too specific about, you know, uh, exactly where. Uh, if we go higher into brain rhythms, we find that they're talking about a correspondence between frequencies in the 40s, 40 hertz range, 40 to 45 hertz, being a gamma brain rhythm that has to do with connections between the middle of the brain and the cortex, back and forth, connecting different parts of the cortex through the midbrain, and that that's associated with consciousness. 
Oh, interesting. So we've got something in the 40s, low 40s, associated with a frequency of, of consciousness. And there's a, there's a spread, there's a spectrum. Just like alpha rhythm isn't just 10 hertz, it's 8 to 12 hertz, maybe in that range. Then if we go up to the range of, uh, you know, about one octave below the 172 hertz, well, one octave below would be 86 hertz, right? 86 times 2, 172. So what's happening there? Well, it turns out that's eye movement. There's an eye movement that's responsible for vision, that we're blind if we stop moving the eyes at that 80 to 90 hertz range. And the center of the spectrum is at 86. And the center of the, of the, of the consciousness frequencies that connect to the middle of the brain and the cortex, the gamma, is at 43, which is half of that. It's an octave relationship. And then if we have that, we're at, you know, in the, in the low 20s, uh, 21.5, we're, we're in the beta range. We're at an activated brain function. And if we take half that, we're in the alpha at 10.75. So, so that was the connection that came to, to, with consciousness from 172 hertz, how that high frequency of the universal consciousness steps down into vision at 86 hertz. Again, 86 hertz, if your retina is not moving at 86 hertz, controlled by the extraocular muscles, this micro saccadic movement, you stop seeing instantaneously. I mean, you're, you're fully blind. There's studies with using a contact lens on the eye and mirrors where you can move the image on the retina. You can't, you, to stop the eye moving, you'd have to use like curare to, you know, to, to stop the, the movement of the eye completely, or you'd have to, you know, hold it with, you know, tongs to, you know, <laughs> prevent the muscles from being able to move it. Those are pretty invasive, but there's a system of contact lenses and mirrors that can stabilize the ocular image. And what happens is you can't see at all, instantaneously. So consciousness isn't just a, an image on the retina, it's movement on the retina at a frequency that's resonant, that's an, one octave away from the material mineral substrate of consciousness, the ormus, the, the, the philosopher's stone that makes up the ghost in the machine, the spirit body, that is where we see, and f from which we project our vision, and we're really not on that level, we're not separate from what we see. What we see is part of us, and we see it where it is, we project it there, and there's actually an energetic effect where we're seeing it that's been measured. <laughs>